now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty of what Indians are all about. I still say we Indian people are believers in the truth. This is the way of life that was given to your people. You born an Indian, you're going to die an Indian. Indianness is a good life. You're facing an Indian this afternoon. Muskogee Media would like to congratulate Principal Chief David Hill for being selected as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2020. Congratulations, Principal Chief David Hill. It's Jay, it's Stone Gold, Gary Five Java Gift Kiddos, Muskogee Radio, Mom Hedge of Whiskey, and joining me in the studio. Angel Ellis, reporter Muskogee Media. First of all, we have Mr. Jason Salzman, pinch hitting for our principal chief at Hill. Wants to talk about some of the issues facing our leadership. Good morning, Jason. Thanks for pinch hitting for the chief. We sure appreciate it. Good morning, Gary and Angel both. Thanks for having me and um, glad to be here. I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the chief. Uh, I'm sorry. I got to be pinch hitting, like he said, but. Uh, you know, I couldn't even make the Times honorable mention list, so uh, you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel today. But no, I I keep up with everything that he's doing communication-wise and, and as still acting as his press secretary for all of the uh, ins and outs and, uh, you know, basically uh, confirming a lot of what you guys have talked about here uh, just now. Uh, those are all things that uh, we already discussed, so I'm, I'm ready to go. Okay, well, let's... Uh what, should we hit him with a softball first? Or the, I mean, right Jason's there? kind of seasoned. We can dive on it. Okay. <laughs> Whatever, you yeah. Just put, chief, pick it out of a hat. Did the chief go to Tahlequah because Barr, the AG, the attorney general, no. is there? Yeah, no, he did not go to Tahlequah. We didn't find out about the meeting uh, till midday, late day yesterday, uh, mm-hmm. actually. And that's unfortunate. Uh, uh, and it's not anything where we're going to uh, get in the mud and blame anyone or anything like that. We have a great working relationship with the uh, U.S. Attorney in the Northern District, Mr. Trent Shores. Uh, he's been an advocate for our uh, fight for sovereignty and, and helping us. And mm-hmm. his office has certainly take on, uh, taken on a lot of work. And his office is uh, to... Uh, basically to uh, not to speak for them but their main issue with speaking with attorney general Barr is to get department of justice help and department of justice aid funding uh for his office bodies yes um uh soldiers (laughs) foot (laughs) feet on the ground whatever you want to call it uh getting help for his office for getting help for light horse police getting help for the uh, Muskogee Creek Nation Attorney General's Office through grant funding and the Department of Justice and everything like that. We've uh, seen the tribe kind of get some of that grant funding, and I think that, like, the U.S. Attorney's Office has kind of, like, advocated for that, especially knowing the climate going on with McGirt co- beco- becoming a decision. Um, and we also have a Muskogee Creek citizen as a tribal liaison in that office, Shannon Cazzoni, who started out here at the tribe and has, you know, been working there. Um, what is the, and they report out every month the indictments that they are doing right now that have charges, you know, in Indian country. We've seen this shift from an indictment that says, you know, Oklahoma statute, whatever the crime is. But now when you look at their indictments, it's um, a list of charges that have also Oklahoma statute combined with crime in Indian country. You know, it might be theft or murder or um you know arson and it's classified as you know murder in indian country so that's a big huge shift for like i'm sure trent shores's office the uh eastern district as well and and in the last month i think i counted up like well over 160 cases that that are going through their their thing um what is What's the climate like for Muskogee Creek Nation? We're having a little bit harder time tracking the cases that come through tribal court because, well, for one, COVID, and it has our, you know, courts operating a a little bit differently. But um, what is it like for our attorney general? Uh, You know, Roger Wiley, is he kind of seeing the same influx of cases that U.S. attorneys are seeing? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of cases. I mean, in the coverage, this is what I told somebody about it the other day. Um, it's like 
the coverage has been so simplistic and so number centric. Everybody wants, what are the number of cases? What are the number? We knew that it would be more cases. It's a lot of work. It's hard work to protect and uphold the sovereignty of the Muscogee Reservation. Um, they're taking on more cases. They're working through it. Um, I, I don't think a number a number of cases gives you a greater idea of just how much work they're taking on. Um, I don't have an actual number right this moment, but I know that the attorney general's office is taking on um, a lot of the cases that you see that, like we said, if it has to deal with a native on the reservation, a non-native against a native on the reservation, um, a little plug here for our FAQs page on the website. Uh, we have a little, um, I guess you could call it a chart there that tells you exactly how these things break down. And you could imagine um, there's a lot of cases. I mean, before this came along, um, this has kind of opened my eyes to how many people in, in Oklahoma <laughs> in our area really just can't deal and can't abide by the law. Yeah. A lot of law breaking going on out there. It's amazing to me that there's so many people uh, that get in, in situations where they're breaking the law or where they're, they're doing something. You know, there's something every day where it comes up and I see something on the news, something's going on, and my mind immediately goes to, oh, I hope they're not Indian, and I hope they're not on the Creek Reservation. You know what I mean? But that's the reality. Um, folk listen to it. Uh, some of the news coverage is sort of alluded to, you know, uh, dangerous criminals being turned loose on the streets, mm -hmm. that our system just has not uh, evolved or was not prepared to yeah. deal with these. And, uh, you know, you've got these dangerous folks, uh, mm -hmm. you know, wandering around out there. And right. the phrase cheap shot comes to my mind. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, do you have anything there on uh, that's their... Uh, in response to it, so to speak. Right. I mean, these people are not walking the street. Well, yeah, and that's way overblown, of course. And, and my thing on that is that we need to get better communication uh, from those agencies, those courts, uh, and those LEOs to our people. Uh, that's what we're hearing right now is a breakdown of, hey, let's just hold on hold this person until we can get them transferred, whatever. And if there's a statute of limitations, we can work through that as well and find discovery, find, you know, what's in the tribal code, everything like that. But if we just have people throwing their hands up, uh, if we have law enforcement officers out there uh, getting to the scene of a, you know, even a speeding ticket or just something very small here in town and, and go, oh, are you Indian? Oh, you are? Okay, I'm out of here. You know, not even wait for Light Horse to get there or anything like that. Um, there is a process, and our assistant attorney general uh, took part in a roundtable with the U.S. Attorney's Office, Mr. Kyle Haskins, talking about the fact that you have to do more than just ask, you know, when you're vetting Native American citizenship uh, or even a red tag. You know, you can't just see a red tag and say, oh, that's a Light Horse problem. So those are things that, you know, we're needing to get better communication from the ground up even at the scene, but to also to the different courts, to the different attorney general's office, DA offices, whatever, with Muscogee Creek Nation. I talked with a reporter the other day about a, a specific case where they said, um, you know, this individual is, is worried about this case that could be dropped because of McGirt. What do they do? They're worried about this person. They're scared of this person. Uh, this was actually two females. And so there's a, there's a family member. We're scared of this person getting out. What do we do? And it's as simple as, you know, our attorney general responded with, it's as simple as obtaining a, a protective order from Muscogee Creek Nation Court if you're scared of someone. Uh, that will hold through till the case is transferred and in, in, into the right courts. So there are... Um, processes in place uh, to make sure that people feel safe uh, in in an instance where, you know, maybe we have to switch courts or switch this case from here to here. Um, but I think the notion that there's just uh, lawlessness and people walking the streets that are the case is getting dropped every day from murderers and things like that, I, I think that's a, a way overblown and just simply not true. Well, you know what? One of the big distinct differences that I've started looking at, I've been trying to track these indictments that are coming from the um, U.S. Attorney's Office. One of the big changes that I'm starting to see is um, in the last 30 days, I've seen more indictments on rape molestation of, uh, you know, indigenous women than I've ever seen come through the federal courts ever. And I think I counted them up the other day and there was something like 27 different um, it was either like a minor, you know, 
a child molestation or it was a violent sexual crime against a female. And we haven't seen the federal, you know, uh, court system picking those charges up like like they should have been. And it, it really kind of makes me wonder in my mind if we might start seeing because of this SCOTUS opinion, maybe we start seeing something here in Oklahoma that absolutely could positively affect missing and murdered and indigenous women. Um, if we start seeing them prosecuting these violent sexual crimes, these rapes, molestations, because those were things in the past I don't think we've seen prosecuted before. You know, they might have been left to the state and for whatever reason, um, you know, in this on the state level, it was an often really ignored problem. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, when you start looking at a, a massive overhaul of a justice process, they can kind of put out these numbers. And like you said, the numbers aren't always accurate because what I'm starting to see in the very beginning, it was hundreds of cases are blah, blah, blah. And because of SCOTUS, well, maybe for the last like several years, um, they were prosecuted wrong. And these are going to be cases that have to be prosecuted because of the incorrect process. They were never free people, but they are now getting tried in the proper format, such as McGirt and um, Murphy, because both of those have been re-indicted in the federal courts. Right. And we're going to see those cases and it's going to inflate the numbers in the beginning. And what you can't really kind of set a trend on is that beginning, you know, for the last 20 years, I've done my taxes wrong. Am I really charged a lot of taxes? Well, maybe to get caught up, I am. But once I start doing it properly, then it levels out and it looks differently in data. So the data can skew here, especially as we're watching, you know, the processes get put in place and done correctly. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. And I think that's kind of what lends itself to the point I was making earlier. You really can't just go in numbers because, like I said, even we've seen with the COVID-19 crisis, you know, you know, it depends on from one week to the next, which numbers you believe or which numbers are correct. We we've, we've heard different stories from different agencies on how numbers are calculated, and everything like that. Um, not to, you know, make it seem like that's what's going on with this. But you're right. You bring up a great point in the fact that, you know, the numbers are counted in ways that you know make it seem like a huge problem when in reality it just needs to sort of settle down do things the right way as i said nobody and none of these uh, agencies that are covering this uh news wise are saying that the state has been acting illegally for over a hundred years um that's our assertion now uh it is what it is and now we must work to fix that get it get the ship righted uh, and and assert our sovereignty, assert our jurisdiction. Um, but again, uh, the snap of the fingers. There's no way that we you could prepare and bolster departments and budgets on a conditionality. And nobody was going, hey, let's pump in twenty million dollars to our Light Horse and AG's office in case McGirt turns out favorably. There's no way you can do that. So that's why we're exploring every option now and doing what we can now in increments. You've seen $2 million plus to the Light Horse Police Department out of our own pocket. That didn't come from a grant. That didn't come from the Department of Justice, anything like that. We're thankful for the 500,000 plus that went to the Attorney General's office. We got a new team of prosecutors uh, excited about that. Uh, but we'll take we'll take any help we can get right now, whether it comes from us, whether it comes from the Department of Justice, the BIA, whatever, those are the things that are going to take incriminately to make sure that we get this thing the way it should be. Is there a, a code or a procedure or a protocol being developed or in place that would kind of solve some of these problems? Is, is it still like evolving? Or? Yeah, and that's, that's a large portion of the work of the Muskogee Creek Nation, uh, the Muskogee Reservation Protection Commission. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are specific subcommittees on that commission that are dealing with looking letter for letter through tribal code and fixing inconsistencies, uh, closing gaps, making sure that tribal code lines up the way that it should with our new reality uh, and, and have it the way that it's going to be comparable to charges and things like that in state courts, federal courts. 
Uh, you know, a, a lot of the things done structurally by the federal government, though, has hamstrung tribal courts to be able to properly, uh, you know, punish and sentence people for crimes committed in Indian country. Okay. You know, this is part of a lot greater of a broken system uh, than just that's going to be a quick, you know, oh, well, we fixed it and let's move on. It's been a hundred plus years of a broken system. And that's led to jurisdictional gaps. That's led to less Muskogee Creek and all Native women uh, not getting justice for being the victims of violence or being the victims of murder and, uh, and all statutes, kinds of things like that. The state statutes for violent crimes against women are actually much lower. Yeah. Um, like the the punishment and sentencing is, is, is than like say VAWA and things on the federal level. Yeah. So it's like the tribal, you know, pursuit and avenues have always been much harder and more protective right. of women right. than even like a citizen of Oklahoma. Like I'm kind of like as a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation, I'm like I wish that my neighbor who is not Creek could enjoy the same protections that I could, you know, because that that's kind of, you know, something that's like you, your own government in the state doesn't see you as valuable as my tribe sees me as a person. And that's kind of really alarming at sometimes. Can you kind of give us some insights? One of the big calls, and this shifts gears a little bit to something that's not really as important as I think protecting women, but but to some people it is. Right now, um, in the state of Oklahoma, people can carry a m medical marijuana card. They can um, purchase medical marijuana. And one of the big calls I keep getting as a reporter covering the justice beat is, um, I'm a Creek citizen or I'm a tribal citizen of any tribe and I'm on this reservation. Um, can they pick me up on a federal charge? Because the federal statutes still criminalize um, mar marijuana and do not allow for medical marijuana. Can you kind of give us any insights on, is the commission looking at things like that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the commission, one of their, one of their main uh, things that they're working on right now urgently is the marijuana question and getting some clarity there. Um, and we have one of the top uh, marijuana lawyers in the state, if not the top marijuana lawyer in the state, uh, Mr. Blake Johnson, uh, is a Creek citizen. He's on the commission. Uh, he basically uh, ushered in medical marijuana law in Oklahoma with Crow v. Dunleavy um, uh, there in Oklahoma City, uh, one of the top firms, not only in the, in the state, but this country, uh, and revolutionized the industry in Oklahoma by setting up sound policy and sound marijuana law uh, and making sure that uh, that was something that was in place before the influx of dispensaries, uh, grow operations, everything like that. Those are things that aren't lost on the Muscogee Creek Nation, definitely not on our citizens. We have citizens that have grow operations that do quite well. We have citizens that uh, have med medical marijuana cards uh, that, uh, you know, use you use marijuana as medicine uh, and use, you, you know, the, the benefits of it uh, for their health. And so I think for us, uh, it became an important issue right on the bat, right off the bat with the Muskogee Reservation Protection Commission was making sure that there was a committee solely dedicated um, to that issue as something that was at the forefront. I know right now they don't have anything concrete as far as me to tell you this is what we're going to do about that or this is the solution to that issue, but they're talking about it and that is at the highest priority right now because of the immediacy of needing to get some clarity on it's, that. It's difficult to be in the limbo situation because what, what can we get, what advice can we give the citizen who is, you know, what I'm scared of and what I'm like hearing reports of is the identifiable native person who may be leaving a dispensary could be picked up on a charge. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think that's a little bit into that scare tactic stuff. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't, I don't know that if you're, uh, you know, native and, um, you know, let's just say look like John Redcorn coming out of a, <laughs> coming out of a dispensary, they're not going to jump on you and, and take you away to federal court. But, but, uh, I think that, um, that's something that I, I think they know we just jumped into. We need time for clarity. That also pushes the necessity to get something clarified quickly, I think. So um, as far as an answer right now, don't have it. Hate that in my profession, not have an answer right now. But that's the same thing with a lot of this McGirt uh, and, and, and Supreme Court decision. We just don't, We, you know, we're working through it, uh, trying to get, as we said, we know that the decision provided ultimate clarity, 
right? This is the way it's supposed to be. Right. This is the way it never was supposed to be disestablished from or whatever. Well, thank you for not slipping into the PR-isms there. Uh, You know, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. No, there there is uncertainty, but I don't think it's sky is falling uncertainty. I think it's opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think it's a chance to get it figured out and make it better. Um, let's uh, switch gears for a little bit. You know, we've had uh, court decisions on the gaming compact saying, nope, yeah. governor, <laughs> you can't have that, nope. There was a great song about Henry VIII uh, that said second verse, same as the first, I believe. And, and I, you know, with the gaming compacts, uh, it took to us, it was a simple uh, black and white letter of the law issue that we don't feel ever should have had to been litigated and sp- cost the Oklahoma state taxpayers millions of dollars. Um, And it's unfortunate that it came to that whenever we could have just said, hey, you know, and and what was really unfortunate is when we saw the first dismissal, well, then we had others come out and it's like, why? This is going to be the same application. Uh, It's going to be the same rules that we follow here, which is the law, you know. And so um, for all of us, it was a sort of, not a ha-ha moment because we're not going to be you know you know we're not going to be adversarial we weren't in the get-go we're not going to be adversarial now we're going to be we're here to work but at the same time uh we we won't be pushed around either or made to feel like what we're doing is on the other side of the law uh isn't ethical isn't fair to oklahoma we heard that a lot this isn't fair to oklahoma which we laugh at because we provide two and a half billion dollars to the oklahoma economy collectively as tribes um and i think what you saw there gary uh it was in the campaign against that push of right from the governor's perspective respectfully their push was this is not fair the oklahoma people are getting a raw deal from tribes what they did not count on and i don't have any idea how they didn't see this was how many of the rural oklahoma people feel every day of their life the impact of tribal nations in their communities what they mean to their schools what they mean to their roads what they mean to their infrastructure what they mean to jobs in some of these places i don't think that they counted on those people going well you can't sell us that bill of goods. You're not going to get us to believe that the tribes aren't being fair to Oklahoma. Uh, we we love the tribes. We count on the tribes. That's not a partisan. The tribal issues in Oklahoma and tribal impact in Oklahoma is not a partisan issue. It's not a Republican or Democrat thing. We have people like Speaker Charles McCall of the House of Representatives in Oklahoma that recognize and value the impact of tribes. The Choctaw Nation, very much thriving in his home community of Atoka in that area. And you've seen Atoka grow exponentially. And you've seen those areas in Southeast, and he sees that. He knows that. He's just one person, though. That question, uh, one step further there. Uh, at the beginning of this, uh, let's just uh, delicately call it disagreement, uh, it looked like there was a potential for a real schism between tribal governments who are asserting their inherent powers yeah. versus a uh, governor trying to, let's say, make a name for himself. And uh, in spite of, you know, for all Oklahoman kind of thing, he was, you know, uh, on the other side of the fence very, very clearly. Right. Is that going to go any further? Is things going to worsen, or are we working on working together? I think we, we've seen other tribal leaders say as much, too. But I think from the chief's perspective, we don't feel that the relationship is broken. We feel like maybe the relationship has taken a couple punches in this first couple rounds, and it's kind of time to sit on the, the stool, get a drink of water, maybe, uh, you know, uh, and regroup a little bit and, and come back out and and, and work together. Um, I think that for us, uh, it as I said again, it, it was never adversarial on our part. It seemed like on the other side of things, um, it almost began with an air of, uh, adversarial conflict or you know this this is uh i'm going after the tribes or we're, we're gonna we're gonna make sure the tribes are, are paying their fair share or something like that um and, and on our end we just wanted to talk we just wanted to have conversation um i know that i'm with the principal chief every single day and i believe the first conversation that we ever had between him and the governor uh was well into maybe june may or june 
I have to go back and kind of uh, catalog all my days. They, they run together a little bit, guys. But I got yeah. That brings up a question for me. The first conversation between Chief and the governor, um, I believe I seen on Chief's social that it came after the state of Oklahoma started pushing this agreement in principle. Yes. So can you kind of give us any insight onto that? That, that agreement in principle was like this massive thing that freaked everyone out. Yeah. And um, it made us all wonder, like, w did Chief have any conversation with that? Was he ever at the table negotiating that? No, Chief Hill never once talked to Attorney General Mike Hunter and never once talked to uh, Governor Kevin Stitt or anybody involved in that agreement in principle um, all the way leading up to its announcement. Uh, and not, not that he never talked to Mike Hunter before. They, I think they had had maybe a, hello, how are you? I'm Chief Hill, or I mean, I'm Council Representative Hill at, at like a, and a function before, but never in, in, a, in a diplomatic stage between Chief and Oklahoma AG, Chief, Oklahoma Governor, there was no conversation. So that was a big part of the, hey, Let's take a pause and, and step back. This isn't, we're not putting our stamp on this because we're hearing from him. This has gone on two years. I've only been chief for five months and I haven't talked to you once. It felt to me a little bit like when your son, like um, like has, you see on Facebook that his girlfriend announces they're moving in together and your son doesn't know about it. You know what I mean? Like that's what it felt like. Okay, let's, uh, let's toss that softball at him now. We just seen uh, news about Time Magazine and 100. Nice to have a softball. Yeah, what the... Uh, what uh, what was Chief Hill's reaction? I think Chief Hill is just a humble guy, uh, and and sort of a that's something that that's part of his re really charm, and I think that people that draws people to him. Uh, the same thing that drew Nightline uh, to him to have a national feature on him and his family. Um, he he comes from humble roots. Uh, he comes from a, a humble beginning and somebody that worked hard his whole life and built himself up at a company and, and became a made man uh, when he got to a, a position to where, you know, he created a wonderful life for his family. And then he decided, hey, uh, my, I don't know why he decided this. I, I need to go back and ask him what he was thinking. But he said, I think I'll get into tribal politics. Oh, you know? boy, yeah. And uh, decided to in the give, face. A, yeah. give a run at the council seat and became a council member for a long time. Have you seen the uh, latest edition? Oh, yeah. the, the Muskogee News. Uh, I got to tell you, Muskogee Media, uh, that is a beautiful cover. I can't wait for people to get that uh, in their newsstands, in their homes, and uh and, and, you know, some folks say hey, we're talking about tribal politics. Some some folks might use it as a dartboard. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, we uh, that, that those of us that are around him every single day, uh, we love Chief Hill. We understand the enormous pressure and amount of stress that he's under leading the tribe in such a tumultuous year. Uh, it's been a grand year, uh, but it's also been tough. And so to see him every single day, uh, keep his resolve, stay steady. Uh, in the face of sometimes criticism, uh, sometimes really tough decisions, sometimes great victories. Uh, to see him keep that steady hand and his personality never waver and remain the same uh, throughout all of that is, is pretty impressive. And it's, it's a joy to go to work for him every day. But when he was announced as a Time 100, uh, it re very deflective. He, he, he didn't like the attention for him self uh, he wanted to make sure that it was the muskogee creek nation as a whole every citizen every employee every healthcare worker every person that came through the trail of tears all of our ancestors a collection of muskogee history and people that brought us to this great moment thanks, fantastic uh, jason for being with us uh, thanks you guys for having me i appreciate it i'm sorry i had to step in for chief